Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to yet another exciting episode of WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm your host and all-around security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting October 8th, 2012. In this week's episode, I cover a bunch of security updates, some cyber espionage accusations between nation states, a couple interesting breaches, and news of a neat new mobile security application. Let's start with the obligatory software update news. As usual, the second week of the month is Microsoft Patch Week, specifically Microsoft Patch Tuesday. So a bunch of security vendors, including Microsoft, released a ton of updates this week. Of course, Microsoft released a bunch of security updates, bulletins for Windows, Office, their server software packages, and SQL Server. I'm not going to go into a ton of details about these updates because you can find written information about all of them on our WatchGuard Security Center blog. So if you're a Microsoft user, definitely go out and get those updates. And don't forget, Microsoft is changing their certificate infrastructure to only accept 1024-bit RSA keys. So make sure all the certificates in your PKI infrastructure are up to date. On top of the Microsoft updates, Adobe also released bulletins. Adobe also shares Microsoft Patch Tuesday, but this month they released a Flash Player bulletin a bit early on Monday. This Flash Player bulletin fixed a whole bunch of uh, vulnerabilities in the very popular media player. We also wrote it about it on the WatchGuard Security Center blog, so check that out. Instead, in this episode, I want to spend more time talking about some web browser uh, software updates that I really didn't talk about very much on our blog this week. Two vendors released updates to very popular web browsers. Uh, Mozilla released a Firefox update, and Google released a Chrome update. First, we'll quickly talk about the Chrome update. It came out on Wednesday. Basically, at a popular security conference called Hack in the Box, Google hosts something called Ponium, and in this case, it was Ponium 2. This is a hacking competition petition where if a researcher can find a vulnerability in the Chrome browser, Google will pay them money for it. This year, one of the researchers did find a significant flaw in Chrome that won him $60,000 and a free Chromebook. The day after this competition, Google released a new version of Chrome which fixes this vulnerability. So if you use Chrome, be sure to update. Chrome does now have automatic updates, so hopefully it's already updated for you. On top of that, this week Mozilla released Firefox 16, which is a new version of Firefox. Besides adding some additional features, Firefox 16 also corrects around 24 security vulnerabilities in the popular browser. So you definitely want to move to Firefox 16 with one caveat. Mozilla actually released this Firefox update on Wednesday. The day after, on Thursday, Mozilla actually had to recall Firefox 16 because they discovered a new security vulnerability that it introduced. Basically, they found that attackers could actually leverage a flaw in the new version of Firefox to figure out which uh, URLs that, that a person went to and gain access to their parameters. So long story short, if you're a Firefox user, definitely upgrade Firefox. But if you upgraded uh, on Wednesday and you have 16.0, you need to actually either remove that and go back to 15, or you need to install Firefox 16.01, which fixes some serious vulnerabilities in their first release. Next, let's move on to two interesting breaches or hacks that happened throughout this week. The first happened early in the week on Monday. In fact, I think it actually happened over the weekend, where a group of hackers found an exploit against the massively multiplayer online role-playing game called World of Warcraft, or WoW. Essentially, some attacker found an exploit that allowed them to kill many, many players on certain servers automatically. So what happened is over the weekend, apparently, people playing World of Warcraft who were in certain cities on certain World of Warcraft servers would just die. Uh, right after uh, Blizzard figured this out, they of course researched it, fixed the offending problem, and it is now okay. But this was kind of an interesting hack. It also shows that attackers do go after gaming servers as well. I think this one was more to 
for fun, but there are many instances of hackers actually stealing money or somehow monetizing some of the online money you have in these massively uh, multiplayer role-playing games. Now, of course, if you're a World of Warcraft user, there's nothing you need to do. The game will update and it will fix itself, so no big deal. The second interesting breacher hack this week was against Facebook. During the week, Facebook learned that there was a flaw in one of the systems they use for looking up other users' phone numbers, which an attacker could leverage to actually harvest or, or gain the phone number of many, many users on Facebook. During the week, Facebook uh, fixed this flaw. So again, since Facebook is a cloud service, there's nothing you need to do to patch it. Facebook already has. However, if attackers actually were leveraging this flaw while it was there, they could have your phone number on Facebook. So really, the moral of this story is be very, very careful when you share information with cloud services. Perhaps sharing your phone number with Facebook is not a good idea. Next, let's talk about what I think is the biggest security story from the week, which is of course cyber espionage accusations between nation states. Early this week, the US government, specifically a panel from the House of Representatives, released a report about Chinese companies doing cyber espionage. Specifically, the report warned against two companies from China, Huawei and ZTE. Huawei makes routers and ZTE is a telecom company. And they said uh, using devices from these companies will put our nation at risk of cyber espionage and intellectual property theft. Now this report had some pretty resounding effects among the media. Everyone is talking about it. In fact, we also heard from some Canadian government representatives that hinted that they too may be avoiding these particular Chinese companies. We also heard some European uh, commissions and governments were also uh, tending to avoid these companies. However, I personally have many mixed feelings about this particular report. I tend to think there's a little bit of FUD or fear, uncertainty, and doubt in it. First of all, the report does warn that they believe that these companies may be doing cyber espionage on the United States. Yet the report doesn't really share very much evidence or, or factual based evidence. Over the past few months, the Congress has invited these companies to come speak during the, the congressional panels, so they have talked to these companies. Uh, but the report doesn't really outline that there's a back door, for instance, in Huawei routers or anything like this. So let me try to clear up some of the facts versus the FUD. There are actually some reasons you might be concerned about the security of Huawei routers. First of all, let's talk about intellectual property. There is a well-known suit between Cisco and Huawei where Cisco seems to claim that Huawei used some of their source code to create their routing firmware. While this particular case seemed to be settled out of court, after it was settled, Huawei changed a lot of their command line infrastructure and a lot of their documentation. And recently, Cisco even posted a follow-up blog post that seemed to suggest or hint at the fact that Huawei really had been using direct copies of their source code in some cases. So there is some evidence that Huawei has used other people's intellectual property in their products. Now that doesn't prove that there's a backdoor in Huawei routers that is stealing US intellectual property today, but it does have some intellectual property connotations. The second true issue is recently a researcher has identified a ton of security vulnerabilities in Huawei's routing devices. Essentially, this research group kind of described uh, Huawei's software coding practices as, as far as their secure coding practices uh, like it was from the 1990s, meaning very, very bad. They ton found a ton of root level, very easy to exploit vulnerabilities, and they really couldn't find a very good uh, uh, security contact at Huawei or even a, a organized uh, security release and patch process. So there is some evidence that Huawei uh, firmware isn't super secure itself. Now the FUD part of this story to me is the fact that the US government is claiming that Huawei and ZT specifically may be used for cyber espionage. This kind of alludes that, that there might be backdoors in these routers that, that are stealing code from the US. And while the, the Huawei code may be technically unsecure, as far as I can see, no one has found evidence of a backdoor. So anyways, while I'm really, really for people informing the public of potential cybersecurity risks. I want evidence-based analysis, not something that may be political in nature. So I'm not saying this particular House report is wrong. Uh, the problem is 
who really knows? Uh, it's missing some evidence, it's missing some technical detail. In any case, it is proof that nation state actors are getting involved in cybersecurity. So it's something we need to pay attention in the future because it will have repercussions on private organizations as well. So after all this deep talk about nation state cyber espionage, let's end on a fun note with a quick security tool tip. During this week, a well-known encryption and security expert, Phil Zimmerman, and the business he works with, released a new encryption tool for mobile devices. It's called Silent Circle. So what Silent Circle is, is an encryption program for iPhones and Android and mobile devices. It performs very, very strong encryption on your phone calls, uh, your chat messages, email, and stuff like that. And it's created to make encryption very, very easy for any user, even a journalist or, or a businessman or whatever. So if you're interested in strong, strong encryption on your mobile device, you might want to check Silent Circle out. It's available on, on the App Store and in other app stores as well. Except that it actually costs $20 a month. So in my opinion, it's a little expensive for normal users. So unless you're really, really paranoid or you have really, really sensitive data on your mobile devices, I'm not sure if this tool's for you. Nonetheless, it's interesting to see strong private encryption in mobile devices. So that covers yet another week in network security. Hopefully something in this episode will help you divert the next network security crisis. In any case, if you're gonna take anything away from this episode, I recommend you make sure to apply all the updates I mentioned. The Microsoft, Adobe, Google Chrome, and Firefox updates are all very important, so make sure to go get them. In the meantime, if you're interested in more regular security news, be sure to check out our WatchGuard Security Center blog where we post this video every week. And also, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, and WatchGuard also has the at WatchGuard tech alias. Thanks for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. <laughs>